After last episode's disappointments, I'm going to cheer myself up by finding out what's in all the boxes that have arrived from PM Tuning. But first, it's back to that poxy engine. Let's see what I can make from it. The cases seem sound enough. Time to have a closer look at them. After last episode's disappointments with the viability of this engine, it's now time to see what can be made of this pony motor. The first task will be getting the silent blocks out of the main casing. After heating up the surrounding alloy, I can get this rather nasty silent block puller to work. This poxy thing was my introduction to cheap tools. All I'm going to say is don't bother with them. When you need to work on a tool itself just to make it work, you know you've wasted your money. With the battered silent blocks removed, it was time to work out what course of action I was going to take with this engine build. After a lot of deliberation and comparisons made with full build prices of various engine configurations, I decided to go with AF Racebeed's latest go faster kit, the RB225 setup. Now you'll all be thinking, that's not going to fit your engine. You'll be right, but I've got a cunning plan chums. This would involve welding up the original cylinder stud holes and drilling and tapping new stud holes in a big block configuration. Getting the ball milled out to fit the larger barrel and adding more alloy around the transfer ports. Obviously I wasn't able to do this myself, but shipping the case off to Manchester, Mike Phoenix Scooters did a fantastic initial job. When the cases returned from up north, I set about opening up and flowing the transfer ports. I used that bloody awful touch up paint that comes with push bikes that never seems to dry to mark the outside shape of the new barrel and you subscribe to mark out the new shape for the transfer ports. Using my electric file to grind away the excess alloy I can now get to work. Now I'm not going for some radical extreme porting job, just enough to get the gases flowing nicely around the kit. With that completed it became obvious that there was an area of the gasket face that just wasn't going to seal too well, so I returned it to get some alloy added. Unfortunately alloy was added in all the wrong places, so I popped over the river into bandit country and got the cases welded up nicely. With the porting of flowing all done, I could move on to the other cases. It was only during the initial photography for this project that I noticed this crack in the chain cover. Not good. What it did do was give me an excuse to have a go at a process I've never tried before. Alloy soldering. First steps were to remove any loose flakes and sand off any oxidising. As with any alloy work, you need to preheat the material, so I bunged it in the oven. Off we go. I noticed the solder wasn't flowing through the crack too well, which I suppose is due to the lack of wetting agent flux as your dews were still brazing. So I turned the case over to apply some solder on the other side. Possibly a bit too much actually. With the solder set I could knock the top off with my body file and start to finish it with the sander. Now this crack in the mag flange was my fault. No, I didn't do it when I first knocked it out. It happened during the porting process. The main case has had some serious welding done to it and some distortion of the mag flange hull was bound to occur, resulting in a very tight fit. So out with the solder again and this got repaired in exactly the same way as the chain case cover. With all the repairs complete, it was time to make the cases look a bit nicer. I started off wet sanding the cases and then going over to use a sizeal mop on my bench grinder with some coarse polishing compound. My first idea was to get the main case painted, but I've owned a painted motor and after a while they chip and get stained and just generally look a bit crap after a while. So as I was going to polish the chain cover I thought why not polish the lot. To get into all the awkward little places I purchased some similar Dremel mops and went about polishing the tricky spots. The next stage in the polishing process is to switch the mop over to this colour stitch one and to start to use a finer blue compound. And yes, I'm using far too much compound. I was still under the impression, the more you use, the faster you would achieve results. The only other time I've attempted to polish alloy was on some chopper motorbike rims. And of course, there aren't so many little nooks and crannies for the burnt up compound to gather up in. So I was pretty ignorant about the amount of compound needed. The final stage in the polishing process is to use a loose fold mop and a fine compound to start getting a shine going.
The last time I tried this malarkey, I swore I'd never do it again. It's such a filthy, time-consuming job. I just thought I'd be happy to pay someone to do this. Unfortunately, the prices they ask in town are silly, so time to get more compound up my nose and in my ears. The final results are certainly no show-stopping mirror finish, but I'm well happy with them, and they look a damn sight better than they used to. The last things I'm going to do to these cases is helicoid a stripped mag flange removing holes, and clean all the threads present, especially the cylinder stud ones. Hopefully I ain't just polished a turd. I'll find that soon enough I suppose. Now, time to assemble something new. Time to get building the forks. I chose these schematic items because the new Indian ones have such a bad reputation and I'm not trusting some old ones of eBay, so I want me these precision made ones from PM tuning instead. To attach the wheel to them, I'm gonna need these lower fork links and to get these into the forks, I'm gonna need all this genuine hardware from PM. First task is to insert the nylon bushes into the links and then using the fork link caps with a spacer recommended by PM, I can hold the internal bush in place while inserting the assembly into the fork apertures. With that in, and a little help from a screwdriver, I can get the fork bolt through to hold it all in place, and then repeating the whole process on the other side. These particular forks have been made to accept outboard shocks, and here we have the bi-turbo coilovers themselves. You're going to notice I've put all this together dry, and that's because this is all coming apart again and sent off to the powder coats once I've finished modifying them. To commence the fork modification, we're going to need the front hub in place, and here is the item in question. A Scoot RS Anti-Dive Front Disc Brake Hub. To bolt this in place, I'll need to use these Casa Nylock wheel nuts and spacers. With the hub in place, we can get the whole thing tightened up and wait for it. Go on. There you go. That's how you chip your brand new caliper. Skill. Now I don't want one of those ghastly carbuncle clamps around my newly painted fork legs, so I need to get the weld on bracket in place. For this I need to carefully position the bracket so that I have some nice parallelogram action going between the anti-dive linkage bar and the fork legs. After faffing about making sure everything's lined up, it's time to get a quick tack in place. With that done, it's time to strip the forks back down and get welding it in place. Now time to remove that dreadful bit of wire from the offside leg and go about cleaning up the entire pair of forks. With all the little discrepancies removed, it's time to build them back up and check the bracket alignment. And of course it's moved a spadge, so time for a little cold setting. With that application complete, we can now tighten everything up and check there's no rubbing on the rotor. Now it's time to dismantle the hub, as a pair of them are off to the powder coaters. Removing the near side lock nut, the bearing, cover, bush comes away.
With the rotor off I can remove the internal circlip and with the aid of my flywheel puller arm I can knock the non-disc side bearing out. After removing the internal axle spacer I can flip the hub over to get at the disc side bearing cover and spacer and remove those. Using my flywheel puller I can now knock out the bearing. Using a large flat blade screwdriver, I can pry the speedo drive collar from the hub using my trim clip remover as a cover to avoid damaging the hub body. Slow and steady, I really do not want to break this. The final task is to remove the rim studs from the hub, which normally with a new hub should not be a problem, but my supplier only had a nasty white one he stopped when I bought it, which meant I would need to chip away the paint just to get a good grip on the studs. With those removed, it was off to the powder coaters with them. The reason for removing the studs from the hub were so I could fit these extended high tensile steel numbers from MB. Why extended? So I could mount these beauties from SIP. Tubeless rims really are a must in my book, and with Conti twists mounted how can I go wrong? Now you've been watching all this stuff about the front hub and there ain't been no mention of the rear one. Well here it is. It's an Indian UNI model, and I went for it simply because it fits on an MB rear cone. So plenty of assembly paste smeared over the surface, it's time to get these lovely rims on and I'm locking them down with these stainless fasteners from MB. Taking it nice and steady so not to scratch the anodizing or the fresh powder coat, I can get them torqued up to their correct tightness and then go through the same process with the newly painted front one. Now it's time to rebuild the front hub and I've sped this clip right up as it's exactly the same process as stripping it down, only in reverse. The slight difference is packing the Japanese bearings with some decent grease. God knows what stuff they'd used before, but it smelt rank. The same goes for rebuilding the forks, and again the only difference being I've sealed the joints inside with sealer and then covered the internals with grease. Same with the fork links, just no sealer. Now with them correctly torqued up, I can address the two problems I found with the initial build. The first being, when centred is a big gap on the non-disc side. The other being the damper nut and bolt interfere with the speed I play. Now I could just cut that section off completely, but I quite like the way it would act as a securing point for the speed I play. So with my trusty Dremel, I widen the slot, and as you can see in the blurry background, it all fits together very snugly. For the gap, I just knocked up an improvised nut spacer for the meantime. The final bit of the fork build up is going to be getting the lower bearing race onto the fork crown. This turned into a very slow and tedious process, so I spared you the monotonous ordeal and gone straight to the cleaning off of the brass, left on the race for my drift. And well there we have it, one pair of snazzy forks and a pair of very black wheels. Nice. Okay, well it looks like the beginning of a scooter at last. Well, the front half of it anyway. I'll see you later.